I'm sure that anybody new to the NICU feels like there are so many equations and numbers that you have to learn. I promise you that in a couple of years, this is all going to feel like you've known it forever. Hi, I'm Dr. Tala, and I've been a neonatologist for over 15 years. So today in this video, I'm gonna go over all those definitions and numbers and equations that we use so freely in the NICU. We'll start with general neonatal ones today, as well as some more definitions and numbers that are involved with feeding and nutrition. In the next video, we'll go over kind of all the other systems, respiratory and blood and everything else. Let's start with gestational age of a baby. So any baby born below 37 weeks, so 36 and 6 sevenths is considered preterm. If the baby is born at 37 weeks until 41 and 6 sevenths weeks, so 37 weeks until 42 weeks, then that baby is considered term. Now, we used to just call that entire period term. And then as more and more studies came out recently, we figured out that depending on where the babies were born within those kind of five weeks, then that would also affect their prognosis. So even those dates were uh, broken down even more. Early term is 37 to 38 and six sevenths weeks. These babies don't do as well as the full term babies. Full term babies are born at 39 to 40 and six sevenths weeks. And then the late term babies are born from 41 to 41 and six sevenths weeks. If the babies are born after 42 weeks, then they're considered post term. Late term and post term babies generally don't do as well as well as full term babies. And then the preterm babies are also divided into groups. And we also know that the younger the baby is born, the smaller the gestational age of the baby, generally the worse prognosis. So late preterm is between 34 and 36 and 6 sevenths. Again, anything less than 37 weeks is considered preterm. The moderately preterm are 29 weeks to 33 and 6 sevenths. And the extremely preterm are babies born below 29 weeks, so 28 and 6 sevenths. So as an aside, the whole neonatal community is trying to come up with further subdivisions for those tiny babies, but we haven't figured out the word yet. Now let's go over the classification based on their birth weight. So if a baby is born at less than 2,500 grams, the baby is considered low birth weight. It doesn't matter what gestational age they're born at, less than 2,500 grams is low birth weight. If they're born at less than 1,500 grams, then they are considered very low birth weight. And if they're born at less than 1,000 grams or one kilo, then they're considered extremely low birth weight. And that's kind of always upset me because there's like a kilo between the first two numbers and then only 500 grams between the second two. But still, those are the definitions. All babies can lose a little bit of weight in the first week to two weeks of their lives. And in those first few days, especially if the baby is in the NICU, especially if they're tiny, you want to calculate their percent weight loss from their birth weight. A lot of computer programs do this naturally, but if you've completely forgotten how to do percentages, I'm going to go over an example. Let's say that you had a 27 weeker born at 850 grams and the baby is now 800 grams. So, so far the baby at like, let's say day of life four has lost 50 grams. So you do 50 divided by the initial birth weight, which is 850 times 100 and you get 6.25. So this baby so far has lost 6.25% of its birth weight. Preemie babies can lose up to about 15% of their birth weight and can take a couple of weeks to get back to their birth weight. Term babies generally lose up to about 10% of their birth weight and they should get back to their birth weight in a shorter period of time. For many hospitals in the US, if a baby is born below a certain gestational age or a certain weight, they're automatically admitted to the NICU. A lot of those hospitals use 35 weeks. So if you're born at less than 35 weeks, or less than two kilos, somewhere between 1800 grams and two kilos, you're automatically admitted to the NICU. About 75% of 34 weekers will need some sort of additional NICU help, about 50% of 35 weekers, and about 25% of 36 weekers will need some sort of additional NICU help beyond what like the nursery can offer. So if you do have a late preterm baby who's staying with a mother, make sure that that baby is being carefully monitored with sugars and feeds and everything else. What about the term SGA or small for gestational age? It is exactly what it sounds like. If the baby 
plotted on the growth curve is at less than the 10th percentile for that gestational age, then the baby is considered SGA. So you have to know the baby's gestational age and you have to know the baby's birth weight and then you have to plot them on the weight curve for the gestational ages and see where that baby lies to actually make that diagnosis of SGA. LGA is similar, it's large for gestational age. So again, you have to plot the baby out. If the baby is above the 90th percentile, then the baby is considered LGA. So SGA and LGA are dependent on the gestational age. Whereas if you're low birth weight, then that's just objectively you're less than 2,500 grams. Another two phrases that we use a lot are the postmenstrual age and the corrected age. So for example, let's say that a baby was born at 28 weeks. So that's the gestational age, a baby was born at 28 weeks. Now let's say the baby is 14 days or two weeks old. So the chronological age is two weeks. So the postmenstrual age for that baby is 30 weeks, 28 plus the two weeks. Corrected age is usually more used more once a baby leaves the NICU. So let's say, for example, that a baby was born at 28 weeks. So effectively, the baby was born three months early or 12 weeks early. So let's say when that baby is four months old, the baby goes to the pediatrician. So the baby is chronologically four months old, but actively because the baby was born three months early, the baby's corrected age is one month. I'm just going to break here really quickly and ask you to comment below and let me know where in the world your NICU is. We're actively trying to fill a map out from all the viewers and all the NICUs in the world. So just let us know. Now let's move on from general neonatology stuff to kind of more fluid GI nutritional stuff. And let's start with some commonly used measuring values in the NICU, which for whatever reason in the US are all just used completely interchangeably. So you really do have to know all of these. So the first thing is one kilo equals 2.205 pounds. And we use those completely interchangeably in the NICU. A lot of the growth curves are all done in kilos. So ultimately you definitely need to be using kilos at some point. Parents are always asking about weights in pounds. And by the way, there are 16 ounces in a pound. And volume, so one mil is basically the same as one cubic centimeter. And one ml of milk or one cc of milk weighs about one gram. Then one ounce is about 30 mls, about 30 grams, maybe 28 to 30 grams. A tablespoon is 15 mls and a teaspoon is 5 mls. These are also commonly used by parents in the unit, tablespoon and teaspoon and stuff. When we admit babies to the unit, the older and the larger they are, generally the lower the amount of fluids that they need. So a term baby, when they're admitted to the unit, we might start them on 50 to 60 mLs per kilo per day. Whereas a tiny preemie baby, we may start on 100 to 120 mLs per kilo per day. If a baby doesn't want to eat PO by mouth, then we would start feeds at somewhere between 20 to 30 mLs per kilo per day, and we'd slowly increase the feeds if the baby's tolerating it. And ultimately, you're taking a baby, whether they're preterm or term, up to about 140 to 160 mLs per kilo per day, hopefully on the feeds. We approximate that there are about 20 calories in every ounce or in every 30 mLs of breast milk. As you all know from anybody that's ever worked in the NICU, the breast milk can look so different when the mother hands it to us. So sometimes it looks like really watery and pale. Obviously, that's probably going to be lower calories. And sometimes it just looks like churned butter, like it's thick whitish cream. And that's probably going to have a lot more calories per ounce. Premature babies need a lot of protein and calcium and phosphorus and just other nutritional elements. So they would have to take a lot of the breast milk to be able to get all of that. So what we can do to the breast milk instead is actually add, whether it's breast milk fortifier or, or a formula-based fortifier to the breast milk to increase the calories and then also give some of the other nutrition that the baby need. So we can add two calories or four calories or six calories or eight calories to make it 22, 24, 26, 28 calories per ounce. A growing baby needs somewhere between 100 and 130 calories per kilo per day. So for example, if a baby is on 160 mLs per kilo per day of 24 cal 
formula or breast milk fortified with formula, then basically the baby is getting 128 calories per kilo per day. So 160 divided by 30 times by 24 is 128 calories per kilo per day. So a perfect amount of calories for a growing baby. Every single day that a baby is in the unit, we should be calculating or adding up the amount of volume as well as the calories that the baby is receiving. And if it's just from feeds, then that's pretty straightforward. If the baby is on TPN as well as on feeds, then obviously we have to calculate how much the TPN is giving the baby. Most TPN computer programs will do this for you. They'll calculate the number of calories and everything else directly. But just for you to remember, in one gram of carbohydrate, there are four calories. In one gram of protein, there are four calories. And in one gram of fat, there are nine calories. In the US, we generally feed babies Q3 hours. So every three hours, we give them a feeding. If the babies are younger, we might do this uh, less frequently. So maybe Q4, maybe even Q6 hours. Other places in the world may feed babies differently, maybe Q2 hours, maybe even continuously, which is why it's even more important that you actually calculate the total volume over the previous 24 hours. What is the GIR or the glucose infusion rate? Basically, it's the amount of carbohydrate that we're giving to a baby per minute. And that GIR should be somewhere between four to eight milligrams per kilo per minute. We don't really want it to go a lot below four because the brain especially needs sugar as a substrate for metabolism. If a baby is not gaining weight, or for example, the mother had diabetes and it's an infant of a diabetic mother, then the GIR may have to go up much, much higher than eight. So it really is important, especially in these cases, to calculate the GIR. And this is the way I calculate the GIR. So it is equal to the concentration of the sugar that you're giving in grams per 100 ml. So for example, if it's D10, then that's 10 grams of sugar in 100 ml. So the concentration of the sugar times the volume that you're actually giving to the baby in milliliters per kilo per 24 hours divided by 144. So let's say that you have a baby that you're giving 144 mLs per kilo per 24 hours, and you're giving D10 to this baby. So 10 times 144 divided by 144 is 10. So your GIR in this situation is 10. If you want more examples or to actually explain how we arrived at that formula, then go look at the GIR video we made. What about urine output in a baby? Well, as you all know, in the first 24 hours, babies only have to urinate once. So we don't normally really count the actual urine output in the first 24 hours, just present. After that, babies should be urinating between one and five mLs per kilo per hour. So notice how ridiculously we talk about urine output every hour, but we talk about the fluid volume in 24 hours because obviously the urine output can change a lot from hour to hour. So let's do an example. Let's say that a two kilo baby in a 24 hour period urinates 132 mLs. Obviously the diapers are being weighed to calculate the 132 mLs or the baby has a catheter or whatever. So the baby pees 132 mLs. So in 24 hours, baby peed 132. So in one hour, baby peed about 5.5 mLs, 132 divided by 24. So the baby's two kilos, so 5.5 divided by two is 2.75 milliliters per kilo per hour. Now let's talk briefly about the equipment that we actually use when we're feeding babies, whether enterally or parenterally. So something that we all use very, very frequently in the unit is an orogastric or nasogastric tube. And obviously these need to be inserted carefully. There are many equations and formula that kind of determine how far you should insert the NG or OG tube. But one of the ones that's used most commonly is the length of the tip of the nose to the earlobe to the space exactly halfway between the xiphoid and the umbilicus. There are also tables that will kind of show you what the minimum length the tube needs to be inserted depending on the maturity of the baby. So I think everybody at bedside gets used to this. I very rarely put in NG or OG tubes.
We know that the gold standard to make sure that the NG or OG tube is in the right position or in the stomach is to get an x-ray. But obviously we don't want to expose a baby to radiation every single time we insert an NG tube or every shift that could be moving or whatever. And so the technique that's pretty much become the most common way of checking it now is to check for acidity in the stomach. So if you pull back some of the secretions, obviously if the tube is in the stomach, then it should have a low pH. The pH should be below five, ideally, or 5.5. If the pH is above five or 5.5, then you can't be certain that you know where that tube is. Maybe it's gone too far, it's gone into the intestine, maybe it's still in the throat, or worst case scenario, maybe it's actually in the lungs. So we generally check the pH of those tubes. And what about umbilical catheters? How do we determine how far in they should be placed? And how should we make sure that they're in the right distance? Well, up until now, we pretty much check with x-rays to make sure that they're placed in exactly the right place. And we'll talk about that in a second. Although we can also be tricked with x-rays. I mean, it's a 2D view, basically. So pretty soon, probably the standard of care will be to check umbilical catheters with ultrasonography, with bedside ultrasonography. So how far should the catheters go in and what equations do we use? So for UAC, and we've all established that the UACs should be high now, so kind of like in the aorta, then the one that we use most commonly is three times the weight of the baby plus nine. So for example, if the baby is two kilos, then three times two is six, plus nine is 15, and then I'll add maybe a centimeter or so for the stump of the umbilicus. So the weight is in kilos and the length is in centimeters. Another equation that's commonly used for the UAC is the umbilicus to shoulder distance plus two centimeters. Obviously, we pretty much prefer the weight one because we're definitely going to be getting a weight on the baby and actually measuring the baby's length, any part of the baby's length is just one more thing that we'd have to do in that low stimulation golden hour period. Then what about the UVC? So the UAC, if you remember, kind of dips down and then goes back up again, whereas the UVC goes straight up. So we're always putting the UVC a smaller length than the UAC. So generally for the UVC, we'll just divide the UAC by two and then plus one. So for example, if we uh, put the UAC in 15 centimeters, divided by two is 7.5 centimeters, plus one is 8.5 centimeters. For the UVC, you can also measure the umbilicus to the nipple and subtract one centimeter. Again, just another measurement that you'd have to do. So where should we see these lines on x-ray? Well, a UAC, like we said, we always want them to be high now. Um, we want it to be in the upper part of the descending aorta. And the UVC, we want it to be in the IVC just outside the right atrium. So what does that generally correlate with on x-ray? And let me tell you, x-ray is not always right, but this is what we use. On x-ray, what we're actually comparing it to is the vertebral bodies. So we want a UAC somewhere between T6 and T9, and we want a UVC between T7 and T9. We want the UVC outside the cardiac silhouette. So generally we want it kind of just above the diaphragm, but outside the heart. My brilliant friend, Dr. Jordan Reese, told me this mnemonic once based on the vertebra and where the UVC is. So T6, you fix. T7 is heaven. T8 is great. T9 is fine, as long as it's above the, the diaphragm. T10, do it again. Don't you just love that? Okay, that's part one. If there are any definitions or equations or formulae that you think we should have included, please let us know below. And when you do comment, please let us know where in the world you are watching this from. We want to fill in our NICU viewer map. Again, thank you so much for being here.